okay i i think we can start so i'll stop sharing my screen uh in a while okay so hi everyone thanks for joining uh thanks for joining us for friday hacks number 193 uh today we'll be having two talks and the first one is by eric who's in the call already and it's about how does it how does it look like working as a fintech developer in singapore so eric gra graduated from nus in com science in 2015 and his professional experience is a lot uh, relating to data engineering and fintech fintech engineering positions so he worked at dbs uh, then he worked at this fintech startup called silo.ai and he's been working at gic for around a year now uh, he also has a blog so you can check out his blog on medium uh, and yeah, so that's about it. I'll stop sharing my screen and Eric, you can take over. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Yeah, let me try to share my screen. Okay. Are you able to see my screen? Yeah, I can. Okay. Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, I think there are a lot of participant around 20 people. So hopefully uh, today's talk might be something interesting for you. So first, uh, I will see that I'm an alumni of SOCD. If, uh, uh, it, actually, if you want to follow me on LinkedIn or read my code at GitHub or follow my stories in Medium, you can follow the links on the left-hand side. So as a short or brief, uh, introduction of myself. I graduated from NUS uh, School of Computing 2015. After that, I, actually my roles uh, as a developer uh, has been a lot of different roles. So first I studied as a research engineer in HP Lab Singapore and then I joined DBS as a big data developer and then my uh, other tryout is actually as a consulting developer in Cylado.ai. So if you're more interested to know what is a consulting developer, maybe you can chat with me after the talk as well. And right now I'm actually a data engineer at GSC, and I'm very pleased to share my uh, experience as a FinTech developer with everyone here. So this is the agenda for the day. So first, before we uh, talk about uh, my fun stories, working as a fintech developer, let's define what is fintech. So, and also I will share some of the communities maybe you are interested in if you want to join a uh, fintech industry. And at last, I will leave some time for if you have any question to ask. So let's get started. So for fintech 101, the first one we want to, de uh, to do is to define what is fintech. So if you forget, or about everything I discussed today. This is one of the slides maybe you want to remember. So if I were the person to talk about FinTech, actually I want to split into two different words. One is Fin, one is Tech. And if I were the person to actually um, design the term, I will call it Tech in Fin. Why? Because Fin stands for uh, financial services and the tech stands for new technologies. So the word is means that we want to use the new technology to seek improve uh, the process or the quality of the financial services. So the key word here is we want to use the new technology and to uh, improve the financial services. So before I com continue, maybe I would like to pause here. So um, do you think that FinTech is very far away from our daily life? Uh, if anyone wants to give an example of what is FinTech you have encountered in your daily life. So let's make this a little bit more interactive. If anyone uh, wants to give a try. <laughs> yeah, that's one of the bad part of uh, doing an online uh, talk because we cannot like always talk with each other. Anyone want to give a try? Don't be shy. <laughs> Unmute yourself. Yeah. yeah, sure. Hello, guys. <laughs> there are some responses on chat. Yeah, sure, sure. Maybe you can help to read out. The general, the expected answer is like pay now, pay now. I banking by DBS. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Good. Good. DBS. Yeah. So maybe. 
Yeah, yeah that's one of the way of uh, fin uh, one of the uses of fintech. Maybe I can share my uh, my encounters or my definitions. So the first one is just now you talk about pay la or pay now. So when is the last time you are using cash? So I think a lot of people are very familiar with uh, using QR code or maybe pay with payment for the uh, for your payment for everyday usage. So this is one aspect of how uh, fintech is relevant to your daily life. So um, it's using in the payment industry. And another one is, uh, so if you look at the forms on the left, so this will be a typical form if you want to open a bank account or you want to apply a credit card. So in the past days, actually, um, we will see that we will just fill the form, give to the bankers, and then wait for maybe a few weeks, then you'll get your credit card. But with the help of the FinTech, which is a new technology, for example, like uh, facial recognition, uh, so we can actually open it online and you can get it much faster. So the key risk or the key challenge here is a typical problem called know your customer. Because when you uh, give the form to the bankers, the first thing they need to do is to verify that you are the person to actually apply for this credit card or the bank. So we need to verify. So this is called know your customer. But with the new technology, there is something called e KYC, which uses things like uh, facial recognition so that you do a video click uh, and then we can verify, okay, you are the one doing this online application. So it actually helps to reach the uh, processing time for creating your uh, bank account or apply the credit card. So this is another usage for opening an account. Actually, there is a lot more. So. First one is maybe in the future, your uh, personal finance advisor will be released by the new uh, robot advisor to help you to manage your wealth. And another one is in the uh, insurance industry. A lot of startups are trying to actually um, make your insurance more digitalized and the experience more digitalized as well. Like for example, the policy poll, which is a good startup on the uh, FinTech. Uh, so I will call this in insure tech industry. Later we can talk a little bit more of this. And we will never forget about the cryptocurrency like Bitcoin. So this is um, one aspect of how FinTech is relevant to your daily life as well. So if I would like to summarize, I actually would like to, uh, this is one of the favorite picture I find online. So it actually categorized FinTech as uh, eight categories. So if you check the history, actually FinTech started around um, 21st century. It first start from the bank. Uh, so if you check the picture, it's the core IT infrastructure and the technology. And then it move on. So with this year, it tries to move on to more customer oriented um, uh, aspects, like for example, retail banking, identity verification, and uh, wealth management and also the insurance. So this is how FinTech is trying to evolve uh, within these years. And with all this, I hope I at least answer the first question, what is FinTech? And uh, if you don't know before now, you know what is a FinTech now. So some of the FinTech communities, especially in Singapore, so these are some of the ones I will recommend if you would like to know more about fintech there is a singapore fintech association and globally there is a fintech connector so these are the communities to help like many people who is interested to find more about fintech to join together link with each other and then uh, singapore actually have this uh, singapore fintech festival every year and there is also money 2020 for asia so these two conferences are the good place for you to actually learn about the new trends in fintech and also learn about how others are using the new technology to solve the uh, problems in fintech uh, financial industry. And uh, last for students, I'm really glad to know that there is a fintech society in US and also in Singapore uh, organized by MES, there is a poly fintech 100 uh, hackathon. I think it's also open to uh, university students. So if you're interested, you can join at uh, this hackathon.
and then uh, this is one of the um, yeah fintech map. So you can see that at least in Singapore, there is a lot of startup uh, joining this. Uh, sorry. So there are a lot of uh, startups uh, in this um, in this uh, fields. So, for example, just now I have mentioned about the insure tech, the policy pool, and also uh, robotic advisors, stash away, and also there is 10x, which is using the uh, actually giving you a credit card so that you can use your Bitcoin or any other uh, cryptocurrency. So I will see if you want to join fintech uh, industry in Singapore, this is really a good start for you. Yeah, hopefully that uh, has given you an overview of the Singapore community for fintech. So now come back to the, I will see more like technical part. So I will share some of the fun stories when I was uh, working as a fintech developer. So this is some of the good, once I have a uh, collabor, uh, I mean, write down in my blog. So if you're interested, you can try to read them. So first one is when I just joined uh, Stellar.ai, actually I had to learn what is the difference, um, uh, how to work well with uh, BA because in financial industry or FinTech industry, most of the time you are dealing with uh, to be user, not to see user. So you will have a, uh, business analyst or business uh, uh, manager, uh, sorry, um, I will say BA. So to help you to get the requirements and then uh, tell the developer what is to do. And then I think there is quite an interesting trick uh, recently because of uh, the US, uh, because of the COVID, then the US actually uh, are looking for COBOL developers because one of the system was down and then there are a lot then not many people are using COBOL nowadays. So by working in FinTech industry, I'm happy to share that I actually work with COBOL before. So if you're interested, you can read the second article. And then the, uh, the other ones are, um, because I'm uh, mainly a Java developer, so I try to uh, learn myself about some Java trading using a FinTech um, uh, terms. And uh, another one I want to share is um, back when in my early days, I was always thinking that as a developer, you don't need to know the domain knowledge or the business knowledge of your industry, but it's proven to be wrong. So yeah, you need to learn about, for example, if you are working in the banking uh, industry, the five terms that I have shared in my blog, you must learn as well. So at last, um, I will coming back to the technical part. So there is one project I have built uh, during my free time. So let's examine how does it look like. So the project is uh, kind of, uh, so before I continue, I also want to pause here to ask a question. So how many of you have been uh, in year two or year three has finished uh, CS3216? Yeah. Any answers in the chat? Because I'm on the slide, so <laughs> not easy to switch back to chat. Can you help me to check? You mean the software engineering module? Yes, correct. CS3216. And then most of people will already know Prof Ben, right? <laughs> yeah, he stopped teaching it though. He stopped. Yeah, yeah. So uh, at my time, it's actually uh, calling 10, yeah. But anyway, my point here is um, there, that is one of the module I remember the most when I was in NUS. So that module has teach us how to do a software project. So at that time, I was not very sure of the documentation or the design part of the project. So after the years in the working industry, so I find out that actually writing a good documentation and uh, analysis the requirement well is another um, important part when you want to build a successful software project. So nevertheless, let's go to the, um, so if you're uh, uh, working on a software project, 
uh, the first thing we want to do is actually analyze um, to find out what are the um, business requirement or what is the app is actually doing. So for this project, actually I divided it into uh, actually two stories and the project is actually uh, uh, trying to use a microservices design to help a company that they can upload a photo uh, and then the photo will be transformed into a SFTP server for their backend user to uh, process. So this is a very general uh, application. So if we check the first user story, it's actually upload the photo. And for most of the to be uh, companies, they will use uh, LDAP as the authentication. So this is one of the requirements. So this is typically how a business uh, user story or requirement looks like. So I will not repeat everything, but if you can see the first uh, user stories um, to allow the end user to, to be able to upload. And then photo is uploaded. There is a wipe main user to check the process to know whether the uh, photo is uploaded successfully and able to delete or edit the photo. And last, this is the uh, uh, part to help you to actually transfer the photo to the SFTP server for the um, end use, uh, sorry, the main user to use it. So this is the architecture design of the uh, application. So if you check on the top, so these are the users uh, which will be using the application to uh, upload the photo. And then just now we have C3 user uh, stories and also in our design, we try to uh, use uh, so-called um, microservices design. So we divide our application into three different apps. So the first app is the web interface uh, or the web app, which is uh, uh, seen by the end user and the two other app, which is the process app and then the transfer app are not seen by the front end users. What they are doing is they will be perform different um, uh, different services once they receive the uh, message from the web app. And then uh, most of the time you will be dealing with uh, companies infrastructure. So for example, we will uh, just now we mentioned about the LDAP server and also you will use a micro, uh, MySQL to store all your, um, uh, for example, the uh, the uh, the user or project information, and then uh, we, uh, the company as FTP is one of the sets of the company, and then we will use uh, RepMQ in this case for the microservice to communicate with each other, and then uh, of course uh, if the company requests, we will send emails. So some statistics about this uh, project. So I have actually finished it within uh, 12 days. And uh, yeah, for local development, I will use Docker Compose to set up. And then this is a multi-project grid build. So before I continue, I will switch back to the, yeah, so talk is cheap. So let's show the code. <laughs> Yeah, as I just now shared, so there are three main apps. Uh, so this common is one of the project as well. So basically this is some of the, so if you are familiar with uh, Spring Boot, so this is some of the way how you organize the project. So some of the common models you will put in one of the project called common. For example, the, uh, um, the repository, which is how you connect with the uh, database, Eric, and then. Oh, yeah. sorry to interrupt. I don't think we can see or see the. Code. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah. yeah, let me stop sharing and reshare, because just now I think I only share the the. Are you able to see now? Yeah, just now I was only sharing. The... Are you able to see now? Can see, can see. Yeah, cool. Yeah, so as I was mentioning just now, there are uh, three uh, main microservices and the common uh, project is actually the one to host all the uh, common 
uh, common uh, you, uh, common uh, entities, like for example, the message to be sent within the uh, different uh, microservices component, the models, which is uh, just now the database design, we have two models, one is project, one is photo, because each of the project you want to link with one of the, uh, uh, sorry, each of the photo you upload, you want to link with some of the projects. And then, um, so each of the microservice will have a similar uh, structure. So uh, you will have a service, you will have some of the configuration. So inside the service, you will be able to receive a message from the other uh, uh, microservice, and then you will perform some of the, uh, uh, some of the action these uh, modules are supposed to be. For example, for this, uh, for this processor uh, application, is trying, once you receive the message, you will reload the photo and append the watermark in the photo. Yeah. So without further ado, this is how we start the development. So if you can check my screen, so for the, because most of the time we are doing local development, you are not able to use the real uh, production environment. So we will mock some of the environment. So in this case, I will use uh, Docker Compose to start up my uh, RabbitMQ database and uh, SFTP. And then once the, uh, database everything is started. Let's open up uh, Mexico workbench to connect to the database to verify. Okay. Okay, so now we can see there is a, a photo and project table here. And then let's also open up our Feldela to connect to our our SFTP local host. Okay. Oh, sorry. One more. Not open yet. Mm. Okay, uh, never mind. Let, let's open the uh, application first. So if we start the UI application as well as the uh, transformer and the process application, we will be able to see the um, web application interface. So it will take some moment for it to loading. Okay, it's trying to connect now. Yeah, SFTP. Oh, oh, I think the password just now I type running. Okay, so it's, it's trying to connect now. If I open the application, you will look like So that's what happened when you do real time uh, demo. So I will need to check the Port, so it's a eight zero one.
Okay, so this is how the application looks like. So Weddy is a uh, uh, framework help you to uh, do PWA application online. So because we are using a test uh, LDAP server, so we can use this user to log in. As you can see, this is one of the, let me scroll. So this is just now I was doing some uh, testing. So I can uh, edit the uh, uh, edit the um, photos or I can do upload some more photos. Let's try to log in using a different user. So now you are a different user, you cannot see what the other user upload. So let's try upload one of the... And when you say, yeah, it's been uploaded. And now you see this is uh, uploaded, so it's not transferred to the SFTP server. When you refresh, it's running to transfer to the SFTP server, and now it's transferred. So, if I can retry again to log in to the SFTP, SFTP server, I should be able to see it. Yeah, sorry, just now I opened the wrong password. So this is the uh, one we have uploaded to the SFTP, uh, SFTP server. So that's all I have for the sharing and demo session. Yeah, so now we can move on to the uh, Q&A session if anyone has any questions. If someone has questions, feel free to unmute yourself and ask, or just type it out in the chat. Yeah, now I can see the chat. <laughs> Hello, is everyone still in? <laughs> uh, um, I actually had a question. Uh, yeah, so, sure. So the demo you gave seemed very software engineering. So it seemed the, the, the entire application seemed very software engineering. Mm. It, it's something which can be applied to software engineering in general. So I was wondering yep. when you develop software specifically for FinTech, are there things you keep in mind? or things which the the fintech developers or the industry keeps in mind? Right. Yeah, I think one of the thing that uh, if I see that fintech is more uh, special is the how you uh, design your uh, application for your client because it's more to be, if, if you are working in a 2C uh, environment, so your, you are actually design your product based on users, but for uh, financial industry is more based on the requirements from the business users. So that's one of the main difference. So that's why I'm presenting on how you ask your question. It does, it does, thanks. Yeah. Are there any more questions? Okay. Oh, there's a question in the chat. Oh. Yeah, sure. I see the question is from Benjamin about how um, can you explain more on why you use microservices? So this is one of, uh, one of the design decision you need to make when you design your application. So one of the benefit of using microservices is just now you see that uh, we actually have three microservices. One is the web UI, one is the transfer app, one is the processing app. So for each of the app, you can actually increase or scale them individually because 
the for example right now we are only um doing for one of the company or in the future we want to do for more companies if you want to scale up your application each of your um application must be individually scalable so that's one of the benefit of using microservices in this detail hopefully that answer your question benjamin Yeah, thanks. There's another question on chat. Uh, what is the RabbitMQ messaging queue used for? Yeah, yeah Rabbit, uh, I think your answer is correct. It's actually used for the internal microservice communication. So RabbitMQ is just one of the option. You can also use Kafka or any other queues. So the main idea here is um, there are two ways your microservices can communicate with each other. One way is using REST API. Another way is more, in my case, I, I will think it's faster is using a, a messaging queue services because the benefit is uh, messaging queue actually help you to prevent duplicate uh, message being picked up by different uh, uh, applications because let's think just now we mentioned about scalability. So if you have more than one uh, processor app is running, you need a way to prevent that. Um, there is a duplicate message sent to the, I mean the same message being picked up by different uh, processor app. So that's one of the benefit of using uh, RabbitMQ or the messaging queue services. Hope that answer your question, Song Tech, right? Yeah. Any other ones? <laughs> Yeah, I actually have a question there. Yeah. How, how do you I, actually, uh, hello, yeah. So, uh, how do you actually balance out like, I mean, when you're working on like FinTech things, probably there are a lot of business that's like, how do you balance it out with like, I don't know, like with the engineering side? Do you, do you think like sometimes like the requirement can be like troublesome or like constantly changing or, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a good question as well because um, a lot of developer will see, okay, the requirement from business is very uh, unreasonable. So I cannot build it, uh, why, why I should do it? So there's one article I write, how to fill up the, um, the just now I, I was also showing on the screen. So usually um, in a good, um, in, in my personal opinion, in a good organization, there will be a business analyst, there will be a developer, there will be also a system analyst. So before the business requirement translate, I mean, reach out to the developers, it will be translated by the system analyst to uh, actually um, evaluate whether the business or what the business user is asking is uh, implementable by the, by, by the technology and also to help to evaluate um, the current system what are the pitfalls to support this um, uh, business requirements. So I think with all the teams working together, then we can still manage the um, user's requirement correctly. Yeah, so the key point here is um, each other should be talking and uh, if we are thinking about agile way of doing the work, so each of the stakeholder that involved in the project should be discussed together rather than uh, just maybe the business user give you a requirement then you trying to implement. So hope that answer your question. Steven, right? <laughs> yeah, 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 thank you. Thank you. Hi, other questions? I, because I have one more. <laughs> <laughs> sure, sure. So, as, as I, you talked about working at a fintech startup called Silot.ai, and I'm just wondering yep. what the what the startup was exactly about, and how it might be different working at a startup versus fintech startup versus a relatively well-established company like DBS or GIC. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, actually, uh, fintech, uh, sorry, uh, Silo AI is actually a company to help um, South East Asia banks to actually uh, improve their uh, capacity or the functionality. For example, one of the work I, I was working on is to help one of the Thailand banks to uh, to be able to use uh, WeChat as one of their payment methods. 
So this is how the startup is trying to do. So I think the difference between working in a big co uh, company like DBS in the fintech industry or the startup is uh, the way or the problem you are getting to solve. In DBS, uh, DBS is the best, best uh, digital bank in the world. A lot of things are already solved in the, um, in the context. For example, uh, you will never expect that DBS will ask uh, how do I uh, add a new payment of WeChat because um, that's one of uh, their strengths. But for some smaller countries like Thailand or Vietnam or some other country, uh, countries, the old banks, they cannot uh, have this capacity. So that's where the fintech startups can help to to solve the problem for the smaller banks yeah hope that answer your question <laughs> thanks yeah i think it's also around the time so <laughs> Are there, no there is no more questions i will uh, yeah okay if there aren't then uh can we have a round of applause for eric for coming down to speak uh, thanks, Eric. Thank you. Uh, yeah, we thanks got for inviting me back. Yeah. So uh, we we got to learn quite a bit about the general fintech industry. Uh, yep. Yeah. So thank you. Uh, our second talk will be uh, JJ from Google, who will be talking about API design. But before that, we'll be taking a break till around seven fifty-five, and we'll come back and. Yeah, so hello everyone. Yeah, we'll, we'll be taking around like uh, a short break until uh, seven, around 7.55 and then we continue with the next talk. Yeah. Wait, did I, did I, did I, was I cracking? Yep. <laughs> oh, my internet sucks. Ah, sorry, sorry, sorry about that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it will start at 7.55 now, right? Where did it go? Yeah, hello everyone. Yeah, we are about to go back and start our second session. Yeah, first of all, can I check whether you are there, JJ? Yup, I am indeed, but I can't present because someone else is presenting. 
Oh yeah, 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 yeah. No, no worries. I will, I will stop sharing my screen after this. Yeah. Okay. Uh, probably got help. It. Okay, it's nine. Uh, 755. I'm gonna just do a little bit of like intro in the beginning. So, yeah. Uh, hi everyone. Like so, as already uh, said in the beginning of this session, like the our second speaker here is JJ, JJ GUX. And just a little bit of intro. JJ is uh, so currently a software engineer at Google who focuses on API design, real time payment, cloud infra, and yeah, he's the member of the Mojaloop uh, Foundation. It's basically a uh, in uh real-time uh, open source real-time payment system building uh, for like the world for like developing countries and like also he's also like the author of two books the google cloud platform in action and yeah uh, the, uh, the one that they will be released around like early next year if you have design patterns and i guess like today jj will talk a little bit about uh talk about like his uh, experience designing like api and yeah probably walk through a little bit through his book and yeah probably jj can yeah do do more about like the intro for himself and like yeah go through like the topics that we'll talk about yeah cool thanks so, Steven. uh let me try and share my screen luckily Stephen and i practiced this earlier <laughs> we had quite a bit of trouble chrome seems to be acting up um all right uh you can all hear me and everything right not too loud in the background we're good yep okay cool um all right hi uh, i'm jj as, as Stephen said um I cover a lot of different stuff here at Google. Um, so just some intro. Um, I was actually Steven's intern host over the summer. So thanks for all your hard work, Steven. Really appreciate it. Um, Steven I actually worked with us on this Mojloop project um, that is sort of my, my focus um, uh, in Google and the, the payments work, um, where I'm currently a software engineer. Um, I actually just moved here to Singapore in January. Um, I've been trying to find a reason to move to Singapore for like, Few years now. Um, if anyone's ever spoken to me about just you know regular stuff, you, you'll know I really, really, really like Singapore. Like this place is the best. So um, I'm super psyched to be here. Uh, so yeah, my current role is in, in the payments org in, in Google, um, and uh, I'm focusing on this open source thing. It's uh, you, you're familiar with how we can use like PayNow to send money uh, to to our friends with a phone number. Not every country has that, and not every country has the budget and technical ability and all these other things to build it themselves. And so um, we're actually working with the Gates Foundation, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, on an open source version of effectively what is underpinning PayNow. And so um, central banks would use it, and then all the banks could integrate with it. Um, and we're hoping to make it, uh, you know, increase financial uh, inclusion around the world. Uh, and so that's my main focus um, here in that involves where we're working with uh, Myanmar, Ethiopia, um, Central Bank of Egypt, Indonesia, a bunch, bunch of folks we're, we're talking to about um, whether or not this can be sort of a, a long-term goal for them. So uh, pretty interesting stuff. Um, before Google, um, I worked primarily on Google Cloud. Um, and so uh, I convinced all the folks that we should buy Firebase and manage that acquisition. Um, I was responsible for building the client libraries. So if you've ever, um, you know, talk to a Google Cloud service in Node.js or anything like that, you're probably using code that I wrote. Um, and then uh, I was ultimately the gatekeeper for Google Cloud's um, API launches. So that means whenever a new API was going to come out, say Cloud Spanner, um, I would sit down with a team and go through their API surface and figure out you know, whether it needed to be changed or not. If it did, then we'd figure out how to change it. If it didn't, then very rarely, uh, then we just let them go. Um, and I wrote a book on all this because uh, I guess that's what you do. I don't know. Um, uh, before Google, which was uh, basically up to 2010, uh, my friends and I started this uh, startup in college. Um, if you've ever seen ads uh, on sites you've never been to saying, hey, you forgot to check out of your cart, um, that's partly one of the things that, uh, that we pioneered way back when. Um, I'm really, really sorry. Uh, when we, didn't, we were college kids, we didn't think how annoying that would become. Um, so Google bought the company in 2010, um, and I was sort of uh, managing the engineering team and designing the API, building the front end. I did not write a book on this, don't worry. Um, uh, but the, the common theme of all this stuff um, has been that I'm really passionate about APIs. That's like the thing that I really, really love. Um, and so all these years at Google, I've been teaching classes on how to design good APIs. So little, I mean, I guess... We all tend to assume that all Google engineers are amazing, but a lot of them show up at 
Google having no idea how to build a good API. And so we have to explain to them how things work at Google and you know, what makes for a good API and all this. Some of the slides that you'll see today are from those um, uh, classes. Um, and uh, after that, I started working on Google's API style guide, which was sort of writing API law books, effectively. It was saying, you must do this, you should do that, you must do this. Sorry, I saw um, MLKit and MediaPub. I did um, work a little bit on MLKit. Uh, not as much, though, and not on MediaPub. Um, so yeah, I was writing API law, effectively, for, um, for Google. It was sort of saying, you must do this in your API. You should not do this. You may only do this in this one exception, that sort of thing. Um, and we realized the API style guide was getting a little bit difficult to search and to, to handle. And so um, I created this thing called AIP.dev. Um, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, and it's, it's a pretty cool project that uh, is now expanding beyond just Google. But it's sort of codifying the, this law for, for APIs. And it's, it's Google's opinion. Um, and others are free to adjust it as they see fit. Um, and in this one, I, I did go and write a book on this one. Um, if anybody's interested in reviewing any of this stuff, um, let me know. I'm happy to share manuscript stuff with anyone who might have feedback. Uh, but I've been talking to um, Professor uh, Ben Leong about potentially figuring out how to do some cool API design research at NUS, because I'm currently working with some folks at CMU, and I figured it'd be cool to involve Singapore, because go Singapore. Um, anyway, today, um, I think it'd be cool to talk about APIs, because I think they're awesome. Um, I want to share some uh, interesting or funny mistakes that we made at Google. Um, I'll pick on some cloud people, because why not? Um, I'll talk a little bit about AIP.dev and like sort of the purpose of it. Um, then there's uh, you know API design patterns are really my, my passion, so I'll talk through one of them, and we'll just talk about some of the cool, weird edge cases that pop up, pop up because APIs are complicated. And then if folks have questions about literally anything, um, if you want to talk about uh, what it's like to work at Google, what it's like to have, sell your company to Google, what it's like to start a company, what it's like to write a book, what it's like to not go to grad school. I, I didn't do that. Sorry. Um, you know, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions you want, uh, and I will. And I know this is recorded, so I will be a little more correct and not as blunt as I would typically be. You can ask Stephen for how blunt I can typically be. Um, so yeah, uh, just diving right in. Um, what the heck are APIs? Um, I keep talking about API design patterns and all this stuff, but I didn't really define what I mean by API. Um, APIs can be anything. If you name it and it has inputs and outputs, then it's an API, right? Um, that can be command line interfaces, like the, the green swiggly thing there. It could be a Go function, like the blue one. Um, my particular focus is on web APIs, which tend to look something like the yellow one, which are like um, HTTP calls with bodies and typically JSON, sometimes protobuf. Um, web APIs are not just limited to HTTP. They could be uh, gRPC or JSON RPC, all kinds of options out there. HTTP is really easy. We all get it. You type a thing in a browser and it sends a GET request. I mean, we're all familiar with it. So it's easiest to sort of use that as our reference point. But at Google, we very rarely talk about HTTP. We talk about protocol buffers. Um, I don't love protobuf. I think it's an interesting experiment. I, I don't think it works for public APIs. I think it works quite well for, for private ones. Um, but, uh, you know, that leads to its own problems. Uh, for this talk, I'll mix and match some HTTP and some protobuf. Um, it should be enough to get the picture, so I wouldn't worry too much. Um, so in our own code, um, we can hide how things work under the hood. Right? That's, that's sort of the magic of this. But when we're doing public APIs, when we're building something that's for use by someone else, it becomes a lot more difficult to hide how those details fit together. Um, and this, this can be a little bit tricky. right? It, it leads us to having to answer questions and solve problems that we typically wouldn't have to answer or solve. Um, and that can make our lives um, certainly more interesting, uh, but certainly more difficult. Um, and the reason is because, um, oops, sorry, because API design is not easy. Um, it's super, super hard to get right. Um, and even when you think you've got it right, someone will come up with this crazy edge case that you never thought about, and you'll walk away going, oh my god, now I have to rip everything up. And the real underlying problem here is that with APIs, um, you're only showing sort of the surface, right, the facade. Under the hood is all where the real work goes. Um, and because you're giving people this surface and they're going to integrate with it, you lose the ability to do all these big refactors that we tend to do so often. You know, if you want to swap out how something works um, and it's your own code, you can do a big refactor and 
as long as the tests pass, hoping that there are tests, I mean, but whatever. Um, as long as it has passed, then it's technically okay. In the world of an API, there are very few changes you can make that will not cause problems for the people who are trying to use your API. And this makes design super duper complicated, like way more than it probably should be, but it keeps it interesting. Um, so in case anybody's terribly bored right now, um, I'm gonna show you two slides that are all you have to know about API design. Um, I do this in all the API design classes, basically, if someone showed up and they're kind of like, oh wait, this isn't what I wanna hear. Um, so the first is the three principles of API design that you should try to follow. Keep it simple, be consistent, and document how it works. That's it. So simple, as simple as possible, but no simpler. You don't wanna dumb it down to Fisher-Price toys that babies can play with, they should be as complex as necessary to do the job, but as simple as you can humanly possibly make them. Um, it's really important because um, we're all busy and just trying to accomplish goals. We are not trying to learn every nuance of every API we've ever experienced. If you've ever learned an API and then suddenly you, know, you have to go learn a different one and it acts totally different from the first one you learned, simplicity comes in hugely handy because you just want to get up to speed as quickly as possible. So if you are trying to recognize some text in an image using an ML API, and in order to do that, you have to learn how OAuth 2 works and, and redesign some crazy schema underneath uh, you know, for uh, an auth token, um, it's really frustrating. And all, all you're trying to do is use the API. You don't want to learn all this other crap that isn't really relevant. So make it as simple as possible. Um, keep it as consistent with itself as possible. And then beyond that, as consistent with the world as possible. Once you learn how to do something in an API, it should be the same across that API. So if retrieving a book is get slash book slash one, then retrieving a you know author should be get slash author slash one, not post slash authors colon retrieve one. It's, it's insane, like it just, just be consistent. If you do something one way uh, for one thing, for other things that are similar, do them the same way. That, that's it, just, just be as consistent as you can. Um, finally, when in doubt, always document things, but whenever possible, document things. If you're making a decision, a decision in an API, explain why you're doing it. Um, it's no good to write in, you know, this line increments i by one. That's not useful. Saying why you're incrementing i by one is much more useful. Um, and try to remember that, like, when you're writing code, just like, uh, you know, when you're writing an API, just like when you're writing code, your audience is your future self. If you ever write some code and then take a break and come back to it a year later, or you know, even a couple months later, you often find that like you have no idea what you were doing or what you were thinking. And uh, the best comments I find are the ones that are like, all right, let me annotate this for my future self so that when I come back to this after having no idea what the heck went, was going on because I was so busy, I should be able to figure out what was, what was happening. Um, so be simple, be consistent, and document what you're doing, and you'll probably end up with at least a mediocre API. Um, the next thing that you should always remember is um, the simple case, the thing that is kicking the tires, trying something out, just trying to make it work, should be really simple, like super easy, the easiest thing possible. Uh, it, if you notice with Firebase, when you first sign up, you don't even have to deal with auth, because what they do is, in the Firebase configuration, it just lets everyone write to the database. It has a rule in there that sort of expires that after 30 days, just to make sure you don't accidentally launch to the public um, with a publicly read or writable uh, database. Uh, which is super important, but right up front, that means you don't have to think about auth. Just, it's not a thing you care about. If you want to talk to your Firebase, just start writing to your Firebase. Um, it's security by obscurity with an expiration date. Um, it's pretty awesome. That's, that's a great design. Um, should definitely, definitely opt for the easiest possible for the simple case. That said, the advanced, convoluted, ridiculous case that only one person in a million is going to need, you still want to support it. Um, now, startups and folks like that get a little more leeway to not support things. At Google, we kind of have to support everything. Um, for example, oh, somebody's coming from Cuba and they need access to something, but they're not allowed to talk to certain servers in the U.S. So because of because of sanctions, and well, we have to still make sure that they can do the one thing that they are legally permitted to do. How ridiculous that is, because the the limits on uh, internet in Cuba, for example. Um, yeah, it's ridiculous, but we still need to make it possible for the rare case that it does happen. So make the simple case easy and the advanced case possible. Now, if you're bored and you don't want to hear me talk anymore, feel free to go grab a beer. I will continue rambling for a while. Uh, you can swing back at the end. Uh, but those are the two slides you should care about when, when building out uh, APIs. Um, this consistency thing, let's talk about that for a minute. It is not easy. 
Um, it sounds easy. You think, oh, I'll just name things the same way, and getting users and getting books or getting authors, they'll all be the same. It'll be fine. It turns out when you uh, become a bigger company uh, like Google is, or when you're working in a team, how often do you work on a group project and you find out that when it comes time to integrate, one person on the team did it this way and another person did it another way? If you think this is just in college, it's not. It's actually uh, the Mars lander crashed into the surface because two teams couldn't agree on the, the units for the, one of the, um, the fields. Somebody thought it was like foot pounds of torque and somebody else thought it was something, something different. And they blew up a couple billion dollars worth of research equipment on the surface of Mars. Cool and interesting story, but pretty mess up uh, end scenario, so I wouldn't recommend that. Um, and this all would have been solved by being more consistent and having a standard that says the units on this must be foot pounds of torque or whatever. Um, we screwed this up at Google. Uh, if you've used the Cloud Speech API, that's uh, the Cloud Speech API, um, I believe you. Uh, you give it audio, sorry, yeah, you give it audio and it turns it into text. So it's like a transcription service. Um, the Cloud Natural Language API is like a, a, a concept recognition text, like school. It'll identify NUS as a you know, proper noun and find it in Wikipedia. It'll identify school as a noun and it'll identify the you know, sentiment or um, uh, happiness or whatever of the, the sentence and say, oh, well, that's, that's a happy sentence or that is a sad sentence, things like that. So negative versus positive sentiment. Super cool APIs, right? And one really cool, interesting feature would be, what if you could take the audio transcription of what I'm saying right now, pump it into cloud speech, and then have it spit out the output in text, and then we would analyze the text to see how happy my talk was, right? That'd be a pretty cool chain reaction. Um, well, one of the things you have to specify to do all this is the language. And it turns out that these two Two teams decided they weren't going to talk to each other that day, and they defined language using two different options. Uh, on the right, natural language uses a BCP47 code. Um, basically, it's an IETF standard that's the thing you see in your browser. So it's EN is the language code, and hyphen uh, US is the, the locale or dialect. Um, in the cloud speech team, they use this enumeration thing um, that basically is a and on the wire, this shows up as a number. So on JSON, you wouldn't see lang.en. You'd see language 55 or something like that. So in order to do this string together, where you have the output of one feed as the input to the next, you actually have a, uh, you need a giant lookup table, which is ridiculous. It's like, why do I want to build a giant lookup table to map between languages? Like, why couldn't you all just get your, your shit together and have something that made sense? Um, it's hard. Like it, it's easy to pick on folks after the fact, but when you're the person designing this, you think, okay, well, what is on the left? You think, what does Google do for languages? And you find some stuff that Google does. And on the right, you have someone going, okay, well, what does the world do for languages? Oh, well, they have this this uh, special IETF standard. And both of them thought they were doing the right thing. That's that's what's so crazy. They, none of them intended to cause a problem. They didn't expect that people would need to string things together, and they certainly didn't intend to cause headaches for people down the line. They thought they were doing the right thing. And that's, that's often the, the issue with API design, is everyone thinks they're doing the right thing. Um, so uh, at Google, we standardized on the one on the right, and you'll see it at uh, aip.dev slash 143. You can see our guidance on those uh, sets of standard fields. Um, but you know, before we had this, uh, this law, the way we did it was by precedent. It's a, uh, akin to common law in, in the legal system in the US, where you kind of look at old court cases and figure out what you should do. Um, it's, it's a lot different, right, uh, to have actual codified law that, like we have here. Um, another example in these, um, and I'm going to pick on the ML stuff again. Excuse me. So I'm going to introduce one third one. Cloud Vision takes a picture, and it'll say, like, oh, that's a dog or oh, that's a cat. Sometimes not very well, but it does its best. Um, and in all of these ML things, you need this concept of, of confidence. The idea of how sure are you that the, the thing that you're annotating is correct. So in Vision, how sure are we that that is a dog? In natural language, like how sure are we that this sentence is positive? Or how sure are we that NUS represents a school and here's its Wikipedia page? How sure are we when we're transcribing this text that you know he said hello and not something else? Like, like hollow, you know, the when a something is empty on the inside. Um, all of these need this concept. And some of them, like speech, only have one thing. It's called confidence, it's a float field. And so you're like, all right, cool, I know what that is. Um, when it comes to vision, it gets a little more confusing because you have confidence. But you also have score and topicality, which for the life of me, I can't remember what topicality actually means. Um, and score is supposed to, in, in ML world, to mean the same thing as confidence. That's what's so confusing here. And so you have to now ask yourself the question, is, is speech's confidence the same as vision score? And it's like, well, I'm not quite sure about that. Like, maybe? And like, 
is score for natural language then the same as score for vision? And is that the same as confidence for speech? And it, you enter into this whole world of like, I have no idea what's going on here. And all I want to know is how sure am I that this annotation is correct? And we as people trying to use the API are just going like, why couldn't you guys get together and just pick something? Is it score? Is it confidence? Like, what is it? Um, and unfortunately, again, these teams didn't talk to each other that day, and not on purpose. They all thought they were doing the right thing. But we ended up with this kind of mismatch of this, this score is not the same as the speech's confidence. Um, so these two are the same, um, but they're not named the same. These two are named the same and mean the same thing, so thank God. But then it gets even more confusing because we have this other thing, salience and topicality, same thing, but not the same name. Um, if you're not confused by now, then I don't know, maybe you're just that good. I, I am baffled, and you're supposed to be confused because this is confusing. It doesn't make sense, and it was it's a bad API design. Um, each one on their own is not so bad, but when you put them together, suddenly things get really messy. Um, same thing happened in other areas of um, Google Cloud, right? So you have Active for Resource Manager, but Ready for Cloud Redis and uh, for Bigtable. And then you have uh, Runnable and Running. Um, and it's just like, which one of these means it's good to go? Like, I, can you just tell me what it, like, how do I know whether I can connect to the, the compute engine machine? Is staging different from provisioning? Should I wait longer? Like, these things are just, they're naming choices, but it turns out that being consistent and naming things is like, it's actually pretty difficult. And these are a core piece of an API is we pick a bunch of names. That's half of what we do all day when we're writing functions for code. So it's really, really messy, and it, simple things that shouldn't be hard suddenly become really, really difficult especially the, the bigger the API gets. And that's uh, typically is the, the direction that APIs tend to go. They don't get smaller very rarely. Um, naming is hard, though, right? It's, and there, there currently are not that many rules, and I feel like there should be a, a few rules. So like This is a, from a news story in the U.S. in 2014. Apparently the most popular girl's name or most unusual girl's name was YOLO. Somebody named their kid YOLO. Um, okay, somebody else, uh, Hennessy, um, Sephora. Royce after the chocolate company, Audi after the car. Like, maybe there should be some rules uh, for Elon Musk, I guess. Um, I mean, it's, it's a crazy world. Naming's hard, um, and we need to write some rules. Um, and AIP.dev is sort of about writing those rules. And in true naming fashion, we got called out uh, by, for our naming by Roy Fielding, who is the guy who wrote the uh, REST. Anybody ever use REST, Roy Fielding? did that, that was his, uh, I think, PhD dissertation. Um, he thought that was a silly name. We talked about it, I don't think it's that silly, but you know, whatever. Um, anyway, um, AIP.dev is not a typo, it means API improvement proposals. And these are sort of the rules, they're, they're laying out some rules. Um, it's our opinion about those rules, and everyone is entitled to their own opinion. We can't stop you from not breaking the rules or writing your own rules. But I think it's important that no matter what, even if we disagree with the rules, we should agree with the questions that they're answering. So if, if the, the question, or sorry, the answer is, here are the names you're allowed to use, maybe we disagree on which, what those names are, right? But we should all agree on there should be some rules for naming. That's it. The rule could be there are no rules, but you should have a policy. Um, so AIP.dev is uh, each doc, they're all numbered, and they're all these narrow, narrowly scoped documents. Um, that describe our opinion, that's Google's opinion, on what APIs should look like, how they should work, how they should be built, and the, the guidelines and rules that underpin a lot of the design at Google. Now, let me stop right here and say, these are relatively new, and Google is an old company, um, and therefore there are many APIs at Google that do not follow these rules. I'm sorry, I can't go back and change how the Google Maps API that was built forever ago does this. Like, we, we can't do that. But all the new ones tend to follow these rules, and that's, that's generally a good thing. Um, and when folks disagree with the rules, they can talk about it, and we'll figure out an answer, and maybe we'll change the rules. Like, that's totally okay. They're not set in stone. We're just trying to do the right thing. Um, so uh, with all these rules, it's time to talk about one of my favorite uh, uh, topics here, which is um, design patterns. And I guess this is um, an interesting slide here, uh, because uh, let's be honest, California is on fire, and you know, sorry about all that. Uh, anyway, climate change. Um, so let's talk about pagination. Um, if you've ever been on a website and you've paged through a bunch of stuff, you click next, 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 right? Um, that's pagination. 
it's taking a long list of stuff and chopping it up into small pieces, right? This is a thing we see all the time. There, are, it's, it's in almost all the large-scale APIs. Um, it is in almost all APIs that have you browsing, or UIs that have you browsing through stuff. So like the Gmail API supports it, you, you know, and the, the Gmail um, uh, UI supports it. You click next when you're browsing through your, your email um, history. It's, it's a pretty common thing, because when you get a whole lot of things, um, if you don't implement um, pagination, it sort of just comes out in a, in a giant waterfall, um, kind of like this. And so it's, it's never a good idea to skip pagination, because when you do, um, yes, it's fine at first, because you only have 10 things. But give it a, give it a minute. Like, someone will find your API. Someone will create a, bil uh, a billion things. And now every time they try to list their items, your server crashes, all because you thought, oh, I don't need to do pagination. Like, it's just, just do pagination. The question then becomes, there's a bunch of ways on how to do it. So how do you do this? A um, bunch of options. So anybody use SQL here? I, I realize usually I'm speaking with a real people, not in corona time. Um, uh, I'm going to assume that everyone says yes to an extent um, if you haven't used SQL. Um, oh, I see some check marks that say yes. All right, cool. Yeah, you can open up the participants and check the yes thing. Sweet. Um, Go Zoom, all right. Uh, anyway, um, so SQL has these limit and offset keywords, right? So you say, okay, well, offset 10 and limit 10 will get you items 10 through 20, right? That's super handy. Well, we should just expose that, right? That's an option. And somebody came along and was like, oh, well, maybe we shouldn't do it like that, and like, because that's leaking a little bit too much about our implementation, and what if we just don't want people to change the page size, like we want to just say page one, page two. All right, well, we'll use page numbers. Um, that can get confusing, too, because like, what, what does page two mean after you've added a bunch of stuff? Is page two the same every time? Turns out, not quite. Like, it, it's not really the same. Um, but people will still bookmark that page and come back to it. I don't know. Um, page tokens are another option. They're sort of just this opaque bunch of bytes that don't really mean anything, except for they're an indicator of, uh, of something um, that you can you know, pin off of, so to speak. Um, the next question comes up is like, well, how big is a page size? Um, you can choose it, or should we set it automatically? Um, is it always exactly when I say I want 10 items? I, should I expect to always get 10 items, or should I get up to 10 items, or should we just aim for roundabout 10 items, like 8 through 13 is all okay? Like, I don't know. Um, what if we want to page backwards? Like in, in the limit offset and page numbers, one, two, three, that's pretty easy, but is that consistent? Like, will that give me, if I get to page two, then wait six months and then go back to page one, am I going to see? truly page one, or I'm going to see something totally different, right? That gets all kinds of interesting stuff. Um, how do we know that we're done paging through stuff? Some people will go, OK, well, if you have a page uh, size of 10, and you get less than 10 items, um, then you must be done, because you must be out of stuff. Well, that doesn't work so well if it's just an upper limit, or if you have that sort of roundabout number. And so that one kind of depends on your exact number limit on the, the page size. So OK, now we've got a dependency here. Um, what do we do? Um, so uh, this is the structure that Google uses. And I have so many things to say about this, I could go for an hour. So somebody please stop me um, around, uh, uh, what time do I have to stop again? 8.45 or so? Stop me by like 8.30. Yeah. Um, OK, so uh, seven more minutes. Um, so in this, you'll see there's, there's three fields um, that really matter. One is the, the page size. We talked about that. That's like a, the size of the, the page. And we'll talk about what it means. And then we're going with the page token option. So in a request, when I call get books, right, I pass in a page token, which is just a string. And then when it comes back with, hey, here's some books, it will also say, by the way, here's how to pick up your next. It's like a linked list. It's a, it's a, excuse me, it's a web API's linked list, effectively. Sounds good. OK, so let's start by talking about um, page size. All right, sorry, one second. Um, um, so first of all, um, there's a lot to unpack here. First of all, uh, we only page forward, and we'll talk about why in a minute. Um, second reason is, the, uh, sorry, the second item is the page tokens must always be opaque. That is, they can't be meaningful. They have to be a chunk of bytes that don't mean anything to the user. Um, we'll talk about that. Um, the only way to signify that we're done with books is by having an empty page token. We'll talk about that in a minute. And then here's the one that's that's a a kicker, and that sort of leads to all the others. The page size is a maximum. It is it's sort of an upper limit. If you ask for 10, we might give you 5. We might give you 8. We might give you 10. We might also give you 0. 
And if you're going, what the hell, like why bother even giving me zero? Like just, just keep working. Um, the answer is um, something called a service level objective, uh, or SLO. SLO is, uh, think of it like a contract. You want to be sure that all your API calls are relatively timely. It's not generally OK to make an API call and have to wait a month for a reply. Uh, even waiting a minute can be pretty painful, and you start to wonder, like, do I have a bug? Did I, did I mess something up? Like, hold on, let me kill the process and try again, and now you waste another minute. Um, and so we, we aim to have our responses in a timely manner, typically no more than hundreds of milliseconds. Anything more than that, and users start to get mad, according to our research. So if you have an SLO, and you have to have an exact number of items returned, uh, and the only way you're allowed to turn fewer than that is by being done with paginating, how do you deal with the fact that maybe you might have a billion items and you're searching through and uh, you know because maybe there was a filter um, specified you know I only want books that are written by um, you know insert your favorite author um, Salinger whatever um, well what if he wrote one book and we found that right away but then we have a billion other books because we're going through the you know the library uh, here in Singapore. And then his other book is all the way at the end of those billion books. In order to return the result, we need to scan through a billion items. What do you think the chances are that we'll get done with that in a couple hundred milliseconds? Slim to none. Probably not going to happen. And so our, our options here are, well, we can either return what we have after a certain amount of time to maintain our SLO, or we can stick to our guns about this whole find everything item. Um, turns out that SLOs are super important. And so, so since we have to maintain that, this whole I'm always going to return 10 items unless there are no more items that match goes right out the window. It just it cannot work. We can't do it. Right? These two are at odds with one another. So we have to choose something. We're going to choose page sizes as, uh, as a maximum. This means that um, these, the only way to indicate that we're done would not be to look at the number of books and compare it to the page size. right? Because typically we'd say, oh, we asked for 10 books. We got eight back. Therefore, we're done. Well, in this case, we can't assume that eight means anything. We can't assume that zero means anything. It might just mean that we got through the next 100,000 that we're searching through. We're going to pick up where we left off when you make your next request. Um, and so the only way to indicate that we're done is by sending an empty page token to say there are no more pages. Um, that's an interesting sort of um, play here. It's, it gets pretty tricky. Um, so under the hood, you might be thinking, well, why not just specify, like, OK, the ID that we're using to pick up here or something like that. Well, so it turned out that Amazon did this. They decided for their page tokens, to use JSON that they would just base 64 in code. And in the JSON was something the equivalent of a limit and offset. And what happened was people decided when they wanted page 10 of their items, they would just limit, offset, base 64 in code, and create their own page token. Like, why do I have to page five times or, or 10 times to get to the 10th page? I'll just make my own token. Well, then Amazon decided they wanted to change things to actually be based off an ID so that instead of picking up after the limit, uh, you know, after the, the offset of 100 items, you wanted to pick up after the ID of item number 100 in case anything got inserted before or after. It made sure that the things didn't get, that, that order didn't really matter and things could stay a little more consistent. But when they did this, all the people who were creating their own page tokens suddenly started seeing errors on their code. And Amazon was like, this was for the S3 API. They're like, well, what the hell? Why are you making your own page tokens? Like, we didn't tell you to do that. Um, that so sorry, deal with it. Um, well, it turns out that no matter what, people will blame you. And so Amazon had to go and roll back some of their changes and make people happy. And you know, even though they shouldn't have been doing it in the first place, it was still their fault. And so our recommendation is that page tokens have to be completely opaque. They need to be just this arbitrary chunk of bytes that are ideally encrypted um, if you want to store something meaningful in them. But they're equivalent to like a session ID. It shouldn't be meaningful to anyone, and just certainly not something you can increment. If you can add one to it and get to the next page, you're doing it wrong. Because people will just say, well, why do I need to keep paging through? I'll just I'll pick the number. Um, I don't need you. And the truth is, we want them to need us. Because if we change the, the way things work, um, it can get really messy. Um, the other issue with these page tokens, though, is if you start supporting backwards pagination, things get a little messy because we don't provide a previous page token. So people have to store the old page token and can request that again. Um, that's up to them. They're fully allowed to do that. But we're not going to actively link to, to a backwards pagination item. Because if we wanted to do that, we, we need to figure out how to handle it. The edge cases here just start growing out of control. We need to think about ordering and filtering. Like, what if new items are added? How do we deal with consistency? If a new item gets added to the list, is it included? Well, it depends, right? Like, we're not saying anything about that. Um, the bottom line, then, since I, I'm going to give myself one more minute to ramble, in case you all are incredibly bored. Um, but the bottom line is, this simple 
four fields, five fields, two, two um, input and output, have me talking for like 30 minutes and I can go for way longer. That's crazy. And this is why API design is so cool. It's because all these things, each one, it's, it's just a string field. It's just an integer field. It turns out that these are just things that, you know, we can talk about forever because they're so complicated and each one holds so much information and so much behavioral, behavioral data that you know, even though two people could look at the same uh, inputs and outputs and have totally different outcomes and totally different results, completely different behavior, and one of them will ideally be better than the other, hopefully this one that we're describing will be the best. Um, so I'm going to stop here because I think I only have like 10 minutes left and I want to give you guys a chance to ask questions about anything. I try to talk fast. Um, but uh, if you want me to keep talking about any of this API stuff, I can absolutely do that. So if there are no questions, I will ramble until Steven stops. So um, feel free, type it in the chat, unmute, and ask. Um, it's all good. Uh, just I know it's Friday night, so um, I unfortunately do not have any beer at home. Otherwise, I would be uh, joining. But uh, yeah, feel free, ask away. Um, I'm here to answer whatever you want. Yeah, thanks, DJ, for the for the talk. Yeah, and yeah, for anyone. If you have any question, feel free to type in the chat box. Yeah. Oh, hi, DG. Uh, this is Eric, uh, the speaker before you. Yeah, I, I was a co-organizer of API Craft Singapore, so I feel that I should stay around to listen about the API design. So glad to know that uh, Google is doing a AIP.dev. So as we all know that there are three, uh, sorry, two hard problems in computer science. Is validation, naming things, and the off by one errors. So I'm glad that Google is solving the naming <laughs> naming things problem now. Yeah. So let's get back to the real questions I have. So the first one is one of the things that um in API will will be the upgrade of the API. So let's say if uh, we uh, I'm building or we are building a like Java application. It, it will be quite easy to do it. I can just add the uh, add depression annotation, then uh, in the next field release, I can remove it. But in the API, what, what is your way to doing the API upgrade? Like for example, Google, as just now you have shared, there are a lot of like legacy APIs. If you want to move them into the new naming convention, how will you do it? And my second question is about, so because we are talking about HTTP API, so, in the old ways, we are always using RPC, and then we move on to REST, and now we are talking about REST is dead, we want to use GraphQL, so what's your view on it? Yeah, so these are right. my two questions, thanks. So the first one, uh, we call that API versioning, right? In, in Java, like you said, you just deploy a new jar, and people have to upgrade, and you can make sure that the method signatures perhaps stay the same, and maybe you added a new field, no big deal. Um, those are backwards compatible versus backwards incompatible changes. Um, I can talk about this for hours. There's a whole chapter in my book about it, and I wrote an article for, so Increment is um, Stripe, um, Stripe's magazine, um, and I wrote an article, it's the cover story for Increment uh, this month, um, and it's complicated um, and long, as you can see here. Um, feel free to read it. I will not try to answer that in the you know, few minutes yeah, we have agree, agree. But um, it, yes, this is a hard problem and certainly one worth um, exploring. So take a look. It's just if you go to increment.com, you'll see the, the article. Um, it's, the answer is it depends. There's, there's just so much that goes into it, unfortunately. Um, and it is one of the very hard things we do. And, and Google screws it up all the time. Um, so does everybody else. On yep. the second one, um, so GraphQL is lovely, right? Um, we're working on um, a bunch of at Google. Um, I'm friends with some of the folks in the GraphQL team at Facebook, uh, and uh, I think it's very powerful in the ability to sort of uh, almost do SQL-like queries over an API and get data out is, is very interesting and very powerful. That said, a lot of the behavior of GraphQL APIs, we tend to think of it as completely different and, and separate from uh, REST, uh, or, or more generally, resource-oriented APIs. But it's actually not that far removed. They're, they're not that... that uh, Far apart, they're kind of like cousins, maybe not siblings, but cousins. Um, I would argue, and uh, you know, people can disagree. This, this is a controversial issue, but I would argue that GraphQL has a very, very good and um, important niche that is a specific area that it's really great at, and that is retrieving data that is all related to one another. Um, 
when it comes to transactional semantics or when the resources or you know the concepts in a GraphQL interface uh, don't really relate to each other all that much, you basically have REST, right? Um, I would argue that REST itself is somewhat limited, especially the purely dogmatic versions of REST that say everything must be post put, you know, you, you don't get anything besides the standard HTTP verbs. I would argue that you should get support for additional verbs, right? When I want to launch a missile and I have a, a missile resource, I want to just call missile.launch. Like I don't want to create a missile slash, you know, one slash launches sub collection and create one of those in order to you know, cause the effect of a missile. Like, that's just not what I want to do. I want to call a method called launch. Um, I think that's an important feature, and REST missed out on that. And so I would argue that um, both have a place. They both do important things. I think REST is artificially limiting itself, and I would prefer to focus on resource-oriented design rather than pure dogmatic REST. Um, but I think there's a place for both. Uh, they can work well together. There's no either or necessarily. Um, you can have two different interfaces to get at the same data, and that's perfectly fine. Um, and I've seen plenty of APIs do that uh, internally at Google, um, and plenty of Facebook as well. Um, so I, I think that they're not mutually exclusive, and it's totally worth um, exploring. Uh, you know, whatever happens to be the best fit for your use case, because the you know, APIs are just designing public software. That, that's it. It's it's just software that you don't get to control because your users are going to use it directly. And whatever fits best fits best. Uh, I think that uh, there's there's plenty of room for interpretation and opinion. And unfortunately, one size fits all is not really the case with APIs. Yeah, thanks a lot for your answers. I can't wait to buy your book. <laughs> yeah, thanks. thanks. Yeah. Hi, uh, Jiwei. Uh, just a thing. So, uh, what is wrong with actually having lookup tables, even however massive they are? Because it seems like it's eventually going to happen. Uh, when things go long enough and there's new things coming up. Uh, Sorry, what is wrong with HTTP having? I missed the first part of the question. I was saying, what is the what is uh, what is the issue with having a uh, large lookup tables? Ah, so the example I gave, there's nothing wrong with having a lookup table generally, right? We we tend to do this um, throughout a lot of code, um, and it itself is not a problem. The issue is this was a the case that I was, I was citing here. Um, let me see, was um, an example where two APIs in the same company with a very valid use case to connect two APIs, uh, the, the two API calls, um, output of one and input of another, together shouldn't require a lookup table. It's not necessary. They, they're two different ways of representing the same thing when they could have just standardized. And so while lookup tables themselves are not necessarily bad, in this particular instance, they are really bad because it's it's needless. It's not important. It wasn't. It absolutely was unnecessary, and it could have been done if someone had just said, "Hey, if the, the speech team said to the natural language team, hey, how are you doing languages?'" And they said, "Oh, we're using this IETF standard because you know the API folks said it was a good idea." They would have said, "Oh, okay, sure, it sounds good." They, they don't care. Like it, it's an arbitrary choice, and in this case, it was arbitrarily chosen wrong. They just they each chose two perfectly valid options. It's just they didn't communicate, and so separately they're fine. Line, but together, it's a real problem, and now you need to make a lookup table. So perfectly fine to make a lookup table if it merits it, if it needs it. Let's say there were two APIs from two different companies, and you wanted to stitch them together. You may need a lookup table. That's that's totally fine. But in this case, it, it's just a mistake that we need one in the first place, and we're making the users have to do this extra work because two teams couldn't communicate, and that's really the issue. Thank you. Uh, yep. it, it just occurs to me that uh, in terms of like I guess it, the under the underlying uh, whole issue of uh, API is that uh, there is this uh, there is this desire to create a service that can last for quite some time, right? And for a service to last for quite some time, there there needs to be like a consistency and there needs to be like rules and structure to it, but. Uh, in terms of like when things move on, as as things just advance, sometimes like certain certain uh certain rules and structures, if we are just too bound by them, they no longer make any sense, and they might actually make further development more difficult. It's kind of like it bounds your it bounds your imagination or your thinking in terms of how to do something. So I think, for example, since you have a cloud speech and you have your uh, natural language uh. Uh, example over there is like even something for like language itself it changes over time. So 
right. Uh, the, the English that we are speaking today is completely different from the English that is spoken 20 years ago. So even as it moves on, we, we can see that something like language will also change. And language itself is an API. It's an API of the human language of the human complication, if you look at it that way. So is there is it really necessary to like um uh, I guess it kind of that I think that to me there needs to be a balance between how much is an API being used and how structured it can emerge from it. Because if it's too structured and it turns out that the usage is very low, then well, why so much structure? I mean Maybe yeah, I, I agree. Um, yeah, I think, I think it's important to remember, right? You, you covered a lot of issues here. So, um, on the structural aspect, uh, I err on the side of saying don't overstructure things. So, a lot of people, when they want to send a search method, they try to design this um, interface that allows you to specify tokens and A equals B and all this other stuff. And I sort of say, don't do that. Just make it a string, give it a grammar, and you evolve the grammar over time. Done. Um, Yep. But this brings us to a new issue, right? This, this talks about, going back to the previous question about versioning, versioning covers things like changing the method signature, changing the types, changing the structure, fine. It also changes things like behavior. So, for example, if we have a translation API and you, know, you translate hola in Spanish to hello in English, um, what if the translation gets better over time? Should, like, how do you control for that? Um, how do you deal with versioning the behavior of what's happening under the hood? And again, the answer is it depends, right? Some people just always want the latest, most up-to-date English translation, right? If you speak Chinese, if it gets better, they just want whatever is the most effective, uh, best communicated. Um, other people care more about the consistency and the, the durability of the, the answer. So when you try to translate something from language A to language B, if you do it, um, if Ola translates to hello today, they might not want the, the you know, best translation a year from now. They might want the exact same one that they got a year ago because it's important to them for their unit tests or for whatever other reason out there. Um, and so this kind of goes back to, you know, it depends, right? Every API will have different requirements on not just the versioning for the interface, but the versioning for the behavior to control and lock in specific behavioral aspects of the API. And that's, again, it's, it just depends on what the API does and who the customers are and what they expect out of the API. Um, some cases, behavior should be locked in. Other cases, like translation, it's like, should you be allowed to fix a translation that was buggy? What if, what if some you know word in English translated into accidentally into uh, a curse word in, in Chinese? Like, should we fix that? Well, technically, would that be a breaking change? Does that cause people's code to break? And is it breaking the contract we agreed to to stabilize and make sure you use the exact same ML model to do the translation? It depends. Like, what are your customers expecting? Which is more important, stability or not having accidentally curse words coming out on the other side? Um, it really, it just, it's going to depend a lot on who the customers are, who's using it, what the API is supposed to be doing, et cetera. So um, structure aside, there's just, there's a lot to be done there as APIs evolve over time, and they always live longer than we ever intended them to. Okay, cool. okay. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions? I cannot tell if we're out of time. Stephen, are we out of time? Yeah, I think if, yeah, if uh, we can have like one more question, probably if anyone has, otherwise, yeah. one more question. Hi, I have a question. Oh, yeah, okay. so thank you so much for your, um, for this talk. And I'd like to ask, because as a student, it's pretty hard to know about all the different API options that, um, that are available. And um, the first time I designed an API, uh, I got like analyzed by a senior engineer sharing with me like so much more different um, options. So I like to ask you like, is there any like resource for us to figure out like the different, more of the different kind of options for, um... <laughs> yeah, I see you're typing. Okay. Yeah, so, um, so the answer is like, I wrote this, this is fine. Um, there are uh, other books, um, a couple of interesting ones. Um, so this one I have not gone through in detail, but it's um, another one. Uh, then there's uh, there was an API design one in Swagger. Come on, ads. 
Let's see if it works. Nope. There it is. Um, so open API, right? Um, there are lots of books out there on how to do this. Um, the most recent article for Increment, um, sorry, the most recent issue, the whole magazine, is about APIs. That was their theme. And they talk about um, how should we build APIs of tomorrow, what it looked like before. Um, empathetic design thinking, thinking can reshape the way we build APIs and the way uh, others go with them. Um, so there's lots of great writing out there that tries to talk about some of these issues. Um, there's a lot to it, and you know you learn by doing. So I would encourage you to try building out an API. Like when I teach the API design class at Google, um, at the second half of the class is an exercise. Try and recreate the Chrome Bookmarks API. And you would not believe how many people come up with completely crazy solutions. And these are Google engineers. Um, and so it's like, you know, you kind of expect that Googlers will know what they're doing, and the truth is they don't. So you're not alone with, uh, with getting torn apart by senior engineers. It happened to me, and it's happened to tons of other people at Google. Um, keep trying to do stuff and experiencing what you can and cannot do with them, and uh, read all you can about you know these different philosophies of APIs and uh, the, the flow of going through and, and building uh, an API, starting with resources, then relationships, and then actions. Um, uh, but there's there's tons of great writing on this. Uh, definitely worth taking a look at. Um, I see one in the chat, uh, and yes. Um, <laughs> Uh, the code that led up to the structure. Um, limiting because the structure is fixed and not extended. Um, so names of fields need to be there, right? Names of functions need to be there. We can't have arbitrary code that you just run all the time because then you run into all kinds of other problems. And the whole point of APIs is to provide some structure. Otherwise, everyone would just SSH into Google, and that would be how they would interact with Gmail. Um, and so we do have to pick names. As much as I hate it, uh, we do have to pick some. And so um, I would encourage folks um, to uh, think about names to the point where you can know what they are without having the context that you have. Bounce it off somebody who has no idea um, what you're talking about and see if they can figure out what the name means. Um, but don't overdo it. If you find yourself spending six hours on the name, chances are maybe the, the concept you're trying to name is not quite right and rethink your concepts. Um, it's, it's tricky, though. I, unfortunately, this is more of an art than a science. If it were a science, we'd have ML do it by now. Um, and I would much prefer that, because at least then it would be a little more consistent. Um, unfortunately, it is not capable of doing that yet. We'll see. Um, but in the meantime, we, we do need names. Name, field names fields need, need names. Uh, resources need names. Methods need names. Um, and so we will have to pick them. Uh, best we can do is choose ones that are as effective as possible for the scenarios that we're in. Anything else? Hi, DJ Eric again. I was looking at the AIP.dev, so I was wondering, is this only like for Google APIs, or it will be like general for any APIs? Is there any so way, like, is, if we are we want to like contribute, is there any way we can do it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's all open source. So um, here's how to um actually set it up a local version and how to do code reviews and all this. If you um, want to contribute, it's all just here. So all these AIPs are just in um, uh, Markdown. So for example, here is one, five, eight. This is the one on pagination. And you can see it's just a bunch of Markdown. Uh, OK, OK. You're more than welcome to contribute. These are just, look, it's, it's just you know some code and stuff like that. Um, the, you can file bugs if you find or if you like. Um, so, so if you're on the same page, you want to edit it, you click edit this page. Um, obviously, sign into GitHub. I just switched to Firefox from Chrome. That's why my login's not there. Um, okay. But uh, anyway, the, the point is, yes, open for contributions. It is Google's opinion. Um, but Salesforce is using this. IBM is using this. Um, a few others are using it internally. Um, blanking on the others. Um, but uh, they're using it. They're just not sharing their own um, because they're not ready yet. Uh, we're the only ones that are sharing. That's why we renamed this to google.aip.dev, because in the future, you will have um, uh, salesforce.aip.dev, and et cetera. So um, others are certainly using it. OK, thank you. Anything else? 
think that should be all probably for this talk. Yeah, yeah. Thanks a lot, DJ, for like the yeah the all the presentation about like activities and pattern and for like answering all of the questions that I've like all the questions. I uh, very much hope to make it to NUS campus um, once the lockdown and maybe there's a vaccine or something like that. <laughs> um, we can do something in person, and I will answer whatever questions anybody has in person, where I can be bluntly honest, and you can ask me this, the silly questions. Uh, so. Looking yeah. forward to it. Yep. Yeah. Thanks a lot, JJ. And for me, do you mind stop sharing your question? Uh, screen. Yes. I want to share like one last screen. Yeah. Sorry yeah. So probably one last screen for like everyone. Yeah. So we have reached the end of our Friday hack session for today. Yeah. Thanks a lot for both of the speakers, Eric and JJ, for coming, taking your time, answering like all the questions that everyone has. Yeah. And yeah, feel free to, for all of you, if you have any feedback, feel free to scan this QR code and yeah, write down what, we are, what are your thoughts on this Friday hacks and how we can do it better. Sorry if probably there are still a lot of things that didn't really go really well because like, actually this is like the first semester for us to do like all the Friday hacks using Zoom because we usually have it organized in person in NUS and like, yeah, in the speakers, we can meet like directly, but now we all can just like talk via Zoom. So yeah. Uh, feel free to give your feedback if you have any we'll be really happy to yeah hope we can improve the Friday hacks especially considering that we'll probably still need to organize the session using zoom for like quite some time until we find like a vaccine and we have yeah, we can do we can meet in person yeah and basically yeah without further ado yeah that's all for this Friday hacks thanks all for coming yeah and yeah hope you all enjoy it thank you See you all in the next one. Uh, what's your favorite date format? Sorry? What, what are your favorite date formats? Date format? <laughs> what do you mean? Date formats, huh? Date formats. Oh. Are you asking me or? <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, I mean, for me, I'm usually like just using like the normal format, which is like yeah, the if I remember correctly, it's the standard dice RFC something or oh yeah, ISO yeah, yeah. I'm usually just using like that one, the ISO X six yeah. Yeah, I mean, for me, I'm probably just using like the DDMM uh, and YYY. Yeah, I'm not sure. The first one, probably. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what the others. Yep. Yeah, anyway, yeah, thanks everyone for coming. Yeah, we are gonna end the session just for like once for all. Yeah. Yep. Thanks all for coming and see you all in our next Friday Hack session. Thank you. I'll end the call up. Yep. Okay, bye bye. Bye.